Hey guys, welcome to our service. I'm so glad that you're tuning in today. If you didn't know, Church on the Move is a family of churches. We have three locations across Northeast Oklahoma. So if you live near one of our locations, come out and join us in person. We have incredible worship and teaching, and of course, amazing environments for kids and students that we want you and your family to experience for yourselves. If you have questions, you can drop a comment below or visit churchonthemove.com for more info. Now enjoy the service. So my bank called me this last week. I don't know what your relationship is with your bank. We don't talk very often. Uh, I try not to go into the lobby. I don't even like going through the drive-thru. I just do mobile banking. I do online banking. And so uh, they tried to call me and I was like, well, that's weird. It's probably like a marketing call, right? It's probably like, hey, do you know about our our interest rates? Or do you know you can get this loan or whatever? So I ignored it. A couple minutes later, my bank tries to call me again. I thought, well, that's not normal. Maybe I should answer the phone. And so I answer the phone and and, and this lady's like, hey, Ryan, this is so-and-so. I'm calling from the bank. And um, we have this, we have this check and it's your check. Um, and it, it, it's, it's written, you're, you signed this check, um, but it's kind of, it's out of order of sequence. It's in an old check, but it's for a large amount. And she's like, you don't, you don't ever write checks. Uh, you don't ever sign the checks that your family writes. And, and, and so she starts going at all these things. I go, hold on, hold on. Is it to uh, this construction company? Because my wife and I, we, uh, our back patio had these problems. So we had it removed and we had a friend who has a construction company and he poured a new concrete slab for us. I wrote him a check in. So she's like, yes. And I go, okay, I, I wrote that check. It's fine. And she was, and she was so apologetic. She, I'm, I'm just so sorry. She, was, she just kept saying, she goes, you just don't ever write checks. Like you just never, you don't ever do this. And, and so it's so like, hey, hey, like you don't have to apologize. Like this is like, thank you, right? Like, thank you for looking after uh, my money because I don't know about you guys, but I like money. Uh, I think money's helpful. It's really important to my life. It, it lets me have a house. Uh, I get to buy food. Uh, you know, my, I get to like clothe my kids. Like all these things are, are possible because of money. And so my money is a big deal. And I love the fact that, that my bank was looking out for my money. And what they were doing was saying, hey, this is, this is an important possession to Ryan. And so we wanna make sure that that we honor him and these things are used for the purposes, for the ways that he wants them to be used, that that it's not being stolen from him, it's not some fraudulent thing, some forgery thing, because our money matters. And that's why we've been in this series of what what does the Bible say about money? And really what that means is what does God have to say about our money? Now, if you've been with us a, a couple weeks ago, we had our our senior pastor, Seth, uh, he was up teaching about this idea uh, that there's this spectrum and sometimes we find ourselves on the end of we have abundance and we have a lot. Sometimes we find ourselves on the end of the spectrum where we have less and maybe it's a little more scarcity and it's hard to get by, but no matter where you're at, there's this trust that has to happen between us and God. And then we had uh, my friend Blake come over this, this last week. Blake talked about stewardship and the idea of stewardship is it's not that we give some to God and then the rest is ours to do whatever we want with. The idea is that if God is the master, then everything that we have is the master's. Therefore, whether it's buying fast food or clothes or investing or school costs or savings, whatever it is, we're stewarding what is actually God's. And so how we spend our money is important. These were, these were great, so it, it's foundational messages. And, and this week, this week has the, the potential, depending on your relationship with money, depending on your relationship with God, uh, it, it has the potential to be possibly a little more, a little more painful <laughs> as we get into some of the practical and as we, as we ask this question of how do I honor God with my money? What does it look like for me to honor God, uh, not just with the entirety of my life, which we're going to talk about, but specifically with my finances? Now, there's a lot of verses we could turn to that talked about honor and to talk about God's position and place of honor. There's a lot of verses and stories we could, we could turn to that, that talk about money and, and what to do with money. But I kept being drawn to this story. There's a story that, that takes place in, in Luke chapter seven. Uh, maybe you've heard it before, but we're gonna, we're gonna read it together. And here's the reason we're gonna spend some time in this story is, I, is sometimes I just find it helpful when we read a story in the Bible and it seems to, to me to just paint this visual that kind of, it, it says more than maybe what I could pull out of some verses. It, it paints an image of what it is uh, that we're really trying to accomplish here when we talk about this idea of how do we honor God and how do we honor God with our money. So Luke chapter 7, we're going to begin in verse 36. 
It says one of the Pharisees. Now, what's interesting about this is uh, this person, he's gonna get a name later in the story, but four times before we're told his name, he's just called a Pharisee. And I think this is important because we're gonna have these two contrasting characters in this story. And so this Pharisee, we're supposed to see him as somebody who was important. He was a, he was a, a teacher, a, you know, a religious leader within their Jewish community. This guy would have been known. This guy would have been a big deal. And so he's you know, kind of the one end of the spectrum. And it says that this Pharisee asked him, him being Jesus, to come eat with him. And Jesus went into the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. Now for some of you parents, you're like, if my kid was to recline at the table, I would smack him, right? You're supposed to sit up straight at the table. This is how it worked back in Jesus's days. They'd have these, they'd have these lower tables and they kind of had like a, a sofa or a couch. And so they would actually lay facing the table and their feet would be back behind them. That's gonna be important here as we continue reading these verses. And it says, and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner. So we have this Pharisee religious leader. Now we have, we have this other character who also doesn't receive a name and it's just a woman. And we're told that she's a woman of the city and that she is a sinner. We're not told what her sin is. We can probably jump to some, collusion, some conclusions if we want to. We could probably say, well, she's probably a prostitute or something. It's some sort of known sin, right, to where people know who this lady is. It's some sort of noticeable public kind of thing that she does. So this is the obviously the opposite of our religious leader. And uh, it says that she learned that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. And so she brought an alabaster flask of ointment. I don't think ointment's the most helpful word because it makes me think if I have like a skin disease or something and I've got to like rub some ointment on it. What, really what she's bringing is she's bringing some nice perfume. And it says, in standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, he said, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. So this Pharisee is thinking, there's no way that this Jesus guy can be who he claims to be. He can't be a prophet. He can't be the son of God because if he was, he wouldn't let this woman touch him. He wouldn't even have to turn around to know who this woman is and what she had done if he was a true prophet. And so therefore he would distance himself from him. Now Jesus, Jesus who is the image of God. He is uh, the truest prophet that has ever walked the earth, meaning he is the, the spokesperson, the, the mouthpiece for God. He doesn't even need to hear this. Remember, the guy said it to himself. Jesus just knows what he says. And so he says, hey, uh, the guy's name's Simon. He says, hey, Simon, let me tell you something. Now, Jesus is a great guy, okay? Jesus is really nice. But when Jesus turns to you and says, let me tell you something, it's not good news for you, all right? It's not gonna go, it's not gonna go your way. And so he says, let me tell you a, a story that Jesus often likes to do. And it's just a, a, a couple of verses. And he basically says, hey, imagine there's two people and uh, each of them owe a debt. And one debt is small and one debt is large and, and, and both owe it to the same person. And imagine that person forgives both of these debts. He says, who do you, who do you think is gonna be more grateful? And they said, well, probably the person with the the bigger debt. And he's like, good answer. You're right. It, the person with the bigger debt would be more grateful. Now, obviously, as the reader, we see what's happening here. Jesus is, is making a point about these two people that he's interacting with. And he, he makes it obvious whenever we jump down to verse 44. He says, then turning to the woman, Jesus said to Simon, do you see this woman? He says, because I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You, you gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, <laughs> okay, there's a, she's, she's had a rough life, they're forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And Jesus turns and he says to her, he says, your sins are forgiven. 
So, so we have this guy who invites Jesus into his house and we're told these things that he doesn't do. Now, these things weren't mandatory for him to do, but they were customary. Like if you wanted to be a good host, if you wanted to put on a, you know, a, a good show for somebody, these are the things you would do. And, and remember that Jesus is a public figure. He's a known figure. Whether the Jews agreed with him or not, whether they liked him or not, Jesus had a following. People wanted to hear what he was teaching. They wanted to know what he was all about. So it was a big deal for Jesus to come into your home. And so what this guy should have done is he should have provided water for Jesus to wash his feet. Even better, he would have a servant there to wash Jesus's feet for him. But he's, Jesus says, Simon, you, you didn't do that. And it would have been customary for him to, to give him a, a kiss as a welcome, just like we would do a handshake. Again, this is an important person coming in. Welcome him into your home. And he says, you, you Simon, you, you didn't even give me a kiss. And then it would have been nice. This one's weird to me, but evidently they put oil on their head. I think maybe it's a hot, dry climate, and it's good for your scalp and your hair. I don't know. It's maybe what they did before dinner. And so he says, you didn't, you didn't give me any oil to put on my head at the table. You didn't do any of these things that you were supposed to do as a good host. But then there's this woman. And you may say, why is she in this house? What's going on here? Well, here's what would happen is when a public figure, an important person like Jesus would come in and, and, and they would be having a discussion, uh, people would, they wouldn't be invited maybe to the meal, but they would come and, and they would look through a window or they would sit at the door or maybe if there's room in the room, they would, they would sit around kind of the outside edge of the wall and they would just get to listen in on the conversation. And remember, they didn't have YouTube, right? They didn't have TV. This is their, let's go listen to the local, you know, rabbi who's traveling around. Let's see what he has to say. So there's all these people there. Now, it probably is out of the ordinary for a woman who's publicly known as a sinner to walk into a Pharisee's house. That was probably frowned upon. But what's even worse is, is she seems to cross this invisible barrier that she doesn't stay by the door. She doesn't stay by the wall. She goes to the feet of Jesus. And she begins to wash Jesus's feet, but she doesn't have a bowl of water. She has her tears to wash his feet. Now, now we're not told any background of who this woman is, but I don't think we're jumping to conclusions to say she had had some sort of experience with Jesus. Right, something had happened. Maybe she had had a one-to-one -one conversation with him. Maybe he had spoken something to her that she needed to hear. Maybe, maybe there had been a healing that had taken place for her or for a loved one. Maybe she was just in a crowd and heard one of his incredible sermons. We don't know what it is, but something had happened. Something had transformed this woman's life that she was so bold to walk into this Pharisee's house, to go to the feet of Jesus and to begin to weep at his feet. And she doesn't have a towel to wash his feet, what does she have? She has her hair. Now in this culture, I'm gonna guess she probably wasn't a married woman due to the title that she has, but, but if you were a married woman in this culture and you let your hair down, if it wasn't up and covered like it was customary, like this is grounds for divorce. This is, a, this is something that women did not do. This was a big deal. And, and kind of the picture we get is she does not care about any of the customs. She doesn't care about any of the status quo. All she cares about is being at the feet of Jesus and, and she is washing his feet and, and, and she's kissing Jesus, not the customary welcome kiss. She is kissing her, his feet like, hey, this is, <laughs> this is the only place that I deserve to be within your presence. And then she, she anoints him, not with an oil, but with this, with this perfume that she brought. Now, I, I don't wear cologne, so if we ever talked in the lobby and I smell, I apologize, but I've just never really been a cologne wearer. Uh, I've owned one bottle of cologne in my, in my life. It was from a seventh grade girlfriend. It was Candies. It was a blue bottle. It probably cost $20 from Kohl's or something. That is not what we're talking about here, okay? Uh, we know from, from some other tellings of this story that this is probably a very fancy jar, flask, of perfume and in fact some people would say this this is maybe like a year's worth of wages that she brings and she anoints Jesus with this is an extravagant this is a reckless <laughs> this is an unbelievable gesture moment gift that she is giving to Jesus and so we have 
We have these two characters, the one who invites Jesus into his home, and, and we don't know what his bad story is. We don't know what his experience is with Jesus. I can guess he probably had heard Jesus teach and probably didn't like the things that he had taught, said. Maybe they'd had one-to-one conversations in the temple. It wasn't really a fan, but he brought Jesus into his home, and he does everything he can to not show Jesus the honor that he deserves. And then we, then we have this woman who enters in, and she does everything she possibly can to give Jesus the honor. So what does it look like for you and me to show honor to God? Because maybe you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm probably not going to run into Jesus at a meal. You know, he's probably not coming over to anybody's house anytime soon. And so what does it mean for me to, to show honor? So here's what I want to do with the majority of our time together today. Is I, I, this is not an exhaustive list, but I want to talk about three ways in which we can show honor. Honor, And we're talking about honor with our relationship with God ultimately, but this is just how we show honor to people, to things, whatever it may be in our life. And and so the first way that we show honor is that we show honor with our heart. We decide the things that we believe are important. We we choose the things that, that we give our heart to, our attention to, our love to. It's why Jesus, or it's why God through the Old Testament prophets Uh, He'll have them say this in a couple different places. They'll say, you honor me with your lips, but your what? Your your heart is far from me. Yes, you say all the right things. Or in Isaiah chapter one, he says, I'm so tired of your rituals and your festivals. You're doing all the right things, but guess what? It's not from your heart. You're not honoring me with the place that it matters. This woman in the story she had not done everything right in her life. We're told her, her sins are many, and yet she, she's able to honor God. There's a, there's a quote um, that I want to read to you. It's from a Bible scholar named Leon Morris, and, and uh, this is what he has to say about the passage. He, he says, Jesus goes on to tell Simon that the woman's sins are forgiven. He does not gloss over those sins. They are many, And we must understand carefully the the words, for she loved much. Jesus is not saying that the woman's actions had earned her forgiveness, nor even that her love had merited it. It's in line with his little parable and his later words that he is saying that her love is proof that she had already been forgiven. It was her response to God's grace. Jesus had her heart because of what she had experienced. Now, in Jesus' day, it was much more of what we would call an honor-shame culture. You and I, we don't live in an honor-shame culture. Uh, There's a lot of these still in our world today. I've never been in one, so I don't understand them that much. But the basic idea is that in these cultures, uh, based on uh, title and position and power, people get honor and they get respect because of title and position, right? And you don't mess with that. That's just how it is. Whether you like it, you don't like it, whatever, you give respect where respect is due. Now, I don't know the kind of culture we live in other than I feel like if there's an opposite of that, that's where, that's where we're trending. And here's what I think has happened, is we've seen people with positions of power or with titles, and we've seen them abuse these positions. And we've seen people who their, their character and their morals did not match up with the position that they've been given. And And we can see this across people's view, whether it's the government or police or teachers or parents, whatever it may be, there's this, it's not just that we don't honor people, it's that we are like, we're leery of somebody that's in a position of power and title. And in fact, when somebody messes up, it's no longer, man, can you believe what that CEO did? Now it's, I knew it, right? That's how they all are. That's what all people in the government are. That's what all, the, you know, we just lump everybody in is that, that there's no honor if you hold a position like that. And, and look, that's a, whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other sermon series. There's a lot we could go into about that. Uh, go home and read Romans uh, 13. The Apostle Paul has some interesting things to say about authority and where it comes from and how we should honor it. Um, but we don't have time to unpack all that. I, I raise the tension though for this reason is I think if, if we get into the habit of viewing these different areas of our life that way, if we're not careful, 
we can begin to, to not put God in the proper place that he deserves to be. And look, Scripture is clear that God is the, the top of the list of the ones who deserves our honor. Nobody else deserves our that is That is the position, that is the place for him and for him alone. And we should honor him with our hearts because of who he is and what he's done. I was thinking about this. My, my, my wife and I, when we have all, all the kids, we drive around a 2011, uh, 2011 Kia Sedona minivan. It is not fancy. I see a dad nodding his head in the back. Thank you, amen. Um, it, it's very basic. It doesn't even have automatic doors. You have to open the doors with your hands, you know, like a peasant. Um, it's... Uh, on the inside, there's... There's just a film. You know, if you have kids, maybe you understand. There's just a film on everything. I don't know where it comes from. It's got an odor. Um, there's trash everywhere. My kids are like, Dad, when are we going to buy a new car? And I'm like, not when you're in it, right? There's absolutely no way. I'm paying money for you to destroy another vehicle. This thing, it's literally, we're taking it to drop it off at the shop tonight. It's, it's, had, a rough, it's had a rough life, this, this 2011 Kia Sedona. So imagine... Imagine if you walked up to me and, and you toss me the keys and say, hey, I want to give you a gift, and it's a brand new, fully loaded Tesla. If you're, not, if you're not a Tesla person, fill in the blank with whatever it is, Corvette, Bronco, Lamborghini, whatever your dream is, you know, you toss me this. How do you think I'm going to, how do you think I'm going to interact with this Tesla compared to my minivan? It's going to be a different relationship, Right? <laughs> This thing's going to go to the car wash a whole lot more than my van goes to the, the car wash. I'm going to get one of those memberships where I know any time that I want. And, and if my, my kids are, you know, they're hopping in with Cheetos, I'm going to say, get away from my car, right? Don't you dare touch my car. Why? Because it has a different place. It has a different place within my heart than this beat up old minivan that I drive. It, I, I, I revere it. I honor it in a different way. And, and that kind of, kind of leads to the next two things that we're talking about, because we honor with our heart, but we also honor with our priorities. There's the old saying, maybe you've heard it before, is uh, show me your calendar and your checkbook and I'll show you what's important to you. Now, some of you are like, what's a checkbook? Obviously, I would fall in that camp because the bank literally calls me whenever I write checks, but, but the idea is, is what you do with your time and your money, which are maybe our, our two most important resources, what, what you do with those things, it shows you what your priorities are. Right? You can't tell me, man, my family is the most important thing to me in the world and then work 80 hours a week and never spend any time with your family. Right? There, there is something there that, that does not match up. And, and this is important, not just with our time and with our money, but with all of our resources. It's important for you and I to recognize the fact that we have, we have a limited amount of all of our resources. Right? I can only give so much time. I can only give so much focus and energy and attention to the things. And we have to choose what are the things that are the most important to us. And in fact, a couple weeks ago, our staff, we did an offsite to plan out 2023 and to talk about calendar and to, to talk about, uh, for, for us as a staff here at West, what are the most important things for us? So whether you're a kids pastor or a student pastor or a worship pastor, whatever it may be, what's the, what are the two to four things that you have to do in order to do your role well and, and to be effective within your role? So, so my title here is I'm the executive pastor. People all the time are like, what is an executive pastor? And that's a fair question. So, so what I told our staff was, here's the things that I have to be spending time doing. I have to be leading our, our team, our staff, really well. I need to be spending time with you, making sure you're resourced, making sure we're working on the right things. Uh, I have to, because we're a multi-site church, I have to be paying attention to what are we doing at other locations and are, are we in alignment with that here at West? I, I need to be looking at key metrics and data to say, are we winning in the areas that we want to win? And if not, maybe we're spending time on the wrong things and maybe we're not working in the, the right ways. And then I can't spend time with, with everybody, but I need to be spending one-on-one -on -one time with people to disciple them and to lead them, but also to know what's the pulse of our church and, and what's going on. And, and so I tell you all that, not because I'm trying to prove that I do something around here, um, but I tell you all that because when I make a decision like teaching on the weekend, guess what happens? It takes away from some of those priorities that I said are the important things. 
I don't know if you guys know this or not, but we prepare for these messages, okay? So we spend some time before we, we come up here. Sometimes maybe you can tell, sometimes you can't, I don't know. But, but it, takes a, it takes a lot of time to study and to prepare and, and to be ready for this. And so some of those things that are most important, guess what, that week they, they fall off whenever you're preparing for a message. And if we're not careful, if we keep saying yes to a whole bunch of things and keep doing these other things, all of a sudden the things that we said are the most important things, no longer we're spending any time or effort or energy or focus on. We, we have to honor what's most important with our priorities. I, I, I can show you this in my personal life as well. Uh, for Monday, you know, Monday through Friday for my wife and I, the alarm goes off at 5 a.m., not because I like 5 a.m., not because I think it's a holy time, but because there are things that I want to do <laughs> that are priorities for me, and if I'm gonna get them done, it requires you know, by that time. So, so we start off with a run. My wife and I are the weirdos that go out in the neighborhood, and we have a headlamp on, and we're running in the dark, and uh, we get back from that. And then my wife's a teacher, and so we get... Uh, the kids and, and her all into the grungy minivan and then they go off to school. And then, then my house is quiet and peaceful. <laughs> and that's the time that, that then for, depending on the day, the next hour to, to two hours, I sit with, with my Bible and, and prayer and, and, and studying and God's word. And, and those are all the things that I try to accomplish before I go off to work. Why? Because my health is a priority for me. My family, making sure they're good and where they need to be is a priority for me. Spending time with God is a priority for me, and so I make space for that on my calendar. We talk about our week nights every single week. Okay, what do we have going on this week? Are we going to spend enough time together at home with one another? I have the, the opportunity to travel this week. I traveled a couple weeks ago, so before I do that, I'll ask my wife. I'll say, hey, is this okay? We're, I'm going to be gone here. I'm going to be gone there. Why? Because these things are priorities, and, and here's, we know this. We know that everybody is created in God's image. Everybody is equal in importance, but not everybody's equal in importance to me, Right? And if I treat you as equal and as important as my wife is, I'm a terrible husband. If I, if I treat you as important as my kids are, I'm a terrible father. We have to choose what the priorities are in our life. Okay, so when we honor something, we give it our heart. Whenever we honor something, we give it priority. And so then we have to honor with our actions. It's why Jesus, he he says, um, he says, hey, if you love me, follow my commands. He doesn't say, if you love me, let's go off on this silent retreat and just spend time. He doesn't say, sing songs. All those things are wonderful, but if you love me, do what I told you to do. <laughs> And it, it, I think Jesus is actually kind of inversing what we talked about what the prophets would say is, uh, you know, they were saying, hey, you're doing all the right things, but it's not coming from your heart. Jesus is saying, if you love me, if you actually honor me with your heart, then you're not going to be able to do anything but to honor me with how you live. It's going to be this overflow of your heart because of the love that you have for me. It's going to, it's going to be a part of how you live and, and, and how your life plays out because it starts with your heart, because there's this, there's this importance there. I think about those two characters, the Pharisee and the sinful woman. We see that they had different approaches to Jesus, and it plays out so clearly in how they behave in front of Jesus. I think about this as a, as a dad. Uh, I don't know, you know how many of you are parents, or maybe you're still in this parenting phase, maybe you're, you're past it. One of my biggest frustrations as a dad is whenever my kids, uh, they, they do the thing that I've, I've told them, asked them not to do like a hundred times, right? And then they do it. And so then I call them out about it. I say something to them. And then they tell me, I'm sorry. And I'm like, I don't want you to say sorry, right? Like I'm tired of having the conversation. You're sorry. What do I want? I want you to change your behavior, right? Maybe I'm the only bad parent. Okay, so... <laughs> Maybe I'll just accept sorry and move on. But for me, it's like, okay, I, I understand they're small humans and their brains aren't fully formed and all that kind of stuff. But for me, it just feels like, it, okay, if you, if you respected and honor the position that God has given me as your father, as somebody who loves you and provides for you and wants the best for you, then you're gonna do the things that, that I've told you to do, right? And it's like this, it's the slap across the face, whatever. They, they honor me with their lips. Hey, Dad, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But the, they don't do the things that I've asked them to do. When we, when we honor someone, when we honor something, it, it has to show up in how we live. And, and when we begin to, to honor God, 
It's going to show up in every single area of your life. It's going to show up in your career. It's going to show up in your relationships. It's going to show up in your time. It's going to show up in how you manage and spend your money. I didn't forget that we're in a series about money. Okay, we were taking the long way around. We were laying a foundation. So now we can ask the question. I want you to ask this question to yourself is right now, I'm not talking about what the ideal is. I'm not talking about the future. I'm not talking about what you're aspiring to right now. How am I honoring God with my money? How am I honoring God with my money? And we think about this, we're thinking about this woman who comes to the feet of Jesus and how she behaves. And we, we think about this idea of honoring God with our hearts and with our priorities and with action with this tangible thing. And, and so I'm going to give you what I think is the best way to honor God with your money. I'm going to give you what I think is the ideal, and that is to give God the first and the best 10% of your income. Some of you are nodding your head, amen. Some of you, the air just sucked out of the room a little bit and it got uncomfortable. Maybe you're like, I've been around church, I've heard this sermon before. Maybe for some of you, you're new and you're like, you want me to do what? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's weird, that's crazy. That doesn't even make sense, right? Why would we be people who would give a percent of our money away to God? Why would we, why would we do that thing? Isn't that a little bit reckless? And, and here's what I know is I know that a majority of Christians who attend church do not tithe. You can pretty much go home, look up any stat you want. You'll see that the numbers are, are, are pretty shocking, that, that Christians uh, overwhelmingly do not tithe. And, and, and here's what I think. I don't think it's because Christians have sat down and they've studied the scripture and they said, you know what, I think this whole Abraham and Melchizedek thing, I, I think that that's actually an Old Testament principle. Not a, I, I don't think it's our, our theological approach. I don't think it's a, I, we've done all the work to, to study every single verse and come to a conclusion. I, I think there's probably some other pressures and I think those are, are, are pretty obvious one is just i don't i don't know if i can afford this this is a terrifying thing this is a this is a huge leap of trust you're absolutely right i'm not going to tell you you're wrong about that that's 100 percent right it's terrifying Maybe for some of you, you've just literally never thought about it. You show up to church, you love God, it's great. You just, your money and God are kind of these two separate uh, items that just, that just don't overlap with one another. And so this morning, I'm just gonna ask you to consider, hey, what would that look like to honor God with every part of your life, including your finances? Maybe for some of you, it's a trust issue. Yes, trusting, will God provide for me or not? But I think there's also a trust issue of, do you trust the church to give to it? I, the church doesn't need my money. They already have enough. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I agree with the way they spend money. I don't, I don't know if I, I, I trust them. I, I, I think what's dangerous about that is we start putting our attention and our focus in the wrong place, and now we're not thinking about honoring God. We're thinking about what are they going to do with it. Let's just let's, let's honor God, and, and, and he's going to work out the other details. My, my wife and I, we, we've been married for 12 years, and really I don't have any powerful story to tell you other than we got married and I was like, hey, we're gonna tithe, right? And she's like, yeah, and I was like, okay. And that's been our, <laughs> it's been our journey of just giving to God. And, and I'll tell you what we do, because I, I, I try to be uh, transparent when it, when it comes to, to how we try to honor God with our money. This is me describing what we've decided. I'm not telling you this is what you have to do. For my wife and I, we just said, okay, we're gonna give at least the first 10% to the church because we believe in the church. The church is the hope of the world. It is the way in which Jesus has chosen to work today. And man, it's a mess. And sometimes we don't get it right and it's not perfect. And I say that as somebody who's a part of being on staff at a church, man, it's, it's not perfect, but, but this is the way that God has chosen to work through his people. And so we're gonna give first and primarily to the church. And then above and beyond that, we're gonna, we're gonna give to whatever God lays on our heart. 
And, and sometimes that's some projects around the world. Sometimes it's friends who are stepping into missions. Sometimes there's needs in our community. We've just said, okay, that's, that's how we're going to give. That, that's the way that we think that God has told us to give. Now, now, what I see a lot in churches today is what we would call tipping instead of tithing. And the idea of tipping is that, <laughs> some of you are laughing, but it's like an uncomfortable laugh, right? <laughs> The idea of tipping is, hey, if there's a little bit left over, I'll give some. If I like the sermon, I'll, I'll give some. If, that's, if that event or that service was nice, we'll give a little, we'll give a little bit. Here's, here's the issue with that approach. It's a, it's a reactive approach to giving. It's saying, if this church, if God shows up, if this makes me happy, then I'll give. And, and what, what we're looking for when, we, for when we talk about the first and the best, and we talk about honoring God, we're saying, I'm going to be proactive, and I'm going to choose before, it's going to be the top of the line in my budget. Before anything comes out, I'm going to give to God. Why? Because that's the place he deserves in my life. That's the seat that he has, and so I'm going to honor him with everything that I have, including, including my finances. Now, for some of you this morning, maybe, maybe the thought of 10% is just in your brain is just impossible. I'd say, okay, what's it look like to start with 1% or 3% or 5% or whatever? Here's, here's what I would really ask you to do is maybe you've heard a money series, a giving uh, taught before, and you've thought about it, and then you've walked out the door, and you've just done nothing with it. I would just ask you, whatever you choose to give, whatever, however you decide it looks to honor God with your money, would you just at least have that conversation with your, your spouse or whoever is, is close to you that you're sharing finances with? And would you have that conversation with God? And just say, God, where, how do you want me to honor you with what you have given me. And, and here's what I think will happen. If you choose to start at 3%, I, I think you'll see, you'll see the goodness of God show up. And sometimes that's in tangible ways. Sometimes it's in, a, in different ways. For, for my wife and I, it's like, why do we give to God? We give to God because he has done everything for us. Everything. And, and I'm not talking about financial debt. I'm talking about... Like he is the, he's our savior, he is our king, he's the reason we have life. Every, we can't look around and not see him, so that's why we give to him. And I, and I think if you begin to give, you, you'll begin to have your eyes open and just see, man, everything is his to begin with. And I just wanna honor him and I just wanna praise him through my giving. Now, let me tell you why I'm passionate about this. It's not because God needs your money. I, believe me, he doesn't need your money. He created everything, he'll be fine. It's, it's not because West is in a budget crunch and this is our secret way to, to raise money and get that from you. It's not because I work off a commission on these sermons. I don't, I promise you. I'm not, not, getting, a, not getting a cut of this today. It's because what I desire most for you, what we want to happen in this church is we want transformation to take place. And when we talk about honoring God with your heart, there is nothing in this world that tends to grab at our heart more than our money. And when we decide to give to God first and with our best, it's placing him at the proper place. And it's this, I don't know what frequency you choose to give, weekly, monthly, whatever it may be. It is this reminder to say, okay, God, I am placing you in the proper place that you deserve. I, I am placing you at the top of my priorities. Look, and sometimes that giving may be painful. Sometimes it may be hard. Sometimes it may be out of a season of blessing and it's gonna feel beautiful. I don't know what it is, but it's just constant reminder. Okay, God, you're first. God, I'm not putting anything else in the position and the place that you deserve. If you would, go ahead and, and bow your heads, close your eyes. Before we, before we wrap up this morning, I wanna... I want to say a prayer over you, but, but I, don't, I don't know what you, know, what you walked in feeling, thinking today about your money and honoring God. But I would say if, if, if you're feeling convicted to say, man, there is something I need to go home and, and I need to pray about and I need to have some conversation about how are we honoring God with our money and are there steps we need to take towards honoring God with our money. If, if that's you, would you just raise your hand with nobody looking around? I just want to, I just want to pray over you. And, uh, and just pray that God would give you. Yes, thank you, I see your hand. I see you back there. Anybody else need, you need to really sit down and say, God, thank you, I see you. Yeah, I see you as well, yeah. Father, I lift these up to you. 
Father, I lift those up in the room that maybe didn't raise their hand and then they know that they were supposed to, Father. Our money is a big deal and it's important and you know that because it's all from you, Father. And we wanna be people who honor you. Not in, not in some areas of our life, not in small portions of our life, Father, with every single thing that we have. And this may be the most difficult, Father. So for those who maybe they've stopped giving and it's time to start giving again, maybe they've never gone on this journey of trusting you. Maybe they're, they've been a, a tipper and it's time to move toward this biblical idea of tithing, whatever it may be, Father. I pray that you give them the courage to have that conversation and to be vulnerable and and to say what they're really feeling with the reservations and fears and hangups and and holds are, that they would be so clear about where they need you to show up, God, for this to happen, for this to take place. And Father, I just pray that they wouldn't They wouldn't write this off. They wouldn't pass by this moment, Father, that they would take this serious, that there is more transformation. There is more work. There are more things that you wanna do in your life, Father. And I believe this is one of those steps for you to take uh, more grip, Father, to take more a hold of their heart and their life and draw them closer and closer to you. Father, we thank you that you are the giver of all good gifts and all good things. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, amen.